Jill Stein was asked a question about foreign policy and ISIS at the Green Town Hall on CNN this week. Let's see what her plan is. You said that you oppose the use of U.S. forces overseas. Uh, U.S. forces are currently engaged in airstrikes against ISIS and other military operations. My question is, do you consider ISIS to be a threat to the U.S. or to U.S. allies and partners in the Middle East? And if so, what would you do to defeat ISIS that the Obama administration is not currently doing? So, you know, there are rules of engagement, international rules, that if you're going to attack uh, another country. You need to be at imminent threat of being actually attacked by them. Clearly that threshold has not been met. Um, ISIS is not about to launch a major attack against our country. Um, and we have a track record now of fighting terrorism. Not only ISIS, but Al-Qaeda before it, the Taliban before that. And this track record is not looking so good. We have spent $6 trillion, according to a recent Harvard study, when you include the costs, the ongoing costs of health care for our wounded veterans who deserve the highest care possible. Um, $6 trillion, which since 2001. Um, we have killed a million people in Iraq alone, which is not winning us the hearts and minds in the Middle East. We have lost tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers that have been killed or severely wounded. Uh, and what do we have to show for this? Failed states, mass refugee migrations, and repeated terrorist threats that get worse with each cycle. So ISIS grew out of the catastrophe of Iraq. Al-Qaeda, in turn, grew out of uh, Afghanistan. And in fact, in Afghanistan, it was the CIA and the Saudis together who created the first so-called jihadi movement with the Mujahideen in order to make trouble against the Soviet Union. So this has been a very ill-conceived plan that has been backfiring uh, madly against us. So what we say is that we need a new kind of offensive in the Middle East because bombing terrorism and shooting terrorism is not quelling terrorism is only fanning the flames of terrorism, the misery and the poverty that drive terrorism. We are calling for a new kind of offensive, a peace offensive in the Middle East that begins with a weapons embargo. And since we are supplying, we the U.S. is supplying the majority of the weapons to actually all combatants, we and our allies are arming most of the uh, fighting forces in the Middle East, uh, we can initiate that weapons embargo. And we also call for a freeze on the funding of those countries who continue to support uh, jihadi terrorist enterprises. She says, let's try this radical idea. How about you use U.S. military force and you can start a war when we are under direct threat of imminent attack? That is the exact same standard we would expect from any other country on the planet. Except maybe Israel and Saudi and maybe Britain we'd let slide too. But pretty much everybody else, we'd be like, okay, uh, you want to start a war. Are you under direct threat of imminent attack and is it to defend your country? Is the answer yes, proceed. Is the answer no, then you're the problem. You're the one doing the offensive war. So, no. But we're above that, bro. Offensive wars, that's what we do. But when we do offensive wars, it's cool. It's cool. We're the good guys by definition. International law, international law. Fuck it. So what she's saying is, uh, I know this is totally crazy, but how about maybe we abide by the same rules and laws that we want everybody else to abide by and we can use our military for defense that used to be the duh position. It used to be the case that if anybody disagreed with that, you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa! You want to do an offensive war? What the fuck is wrong with you, man? But now we're just so used to war that it's like... <laughs> is it brunch yet? Have you invaded a new country? Get on that. So, 100% right on that. And look, I, you know, I, 
I mean, I think I'm almost in total agreement with her. I, I would say I also have no problem, though, with if you want to aid the people who are on the front lines fighting ISIS, and we know that they're fighting ISIS, and we know that they're people who their value system align with ours, the guns are not going to be turned on us, well, then I have no problem with you giving them aid. For example, if you want to give the Kurds aid. Now, perhaps we don't do as much as we can on that front because of our relationship with Turkey, and we don't want to piss off Turkey because Turkey hates the Kurds, so on and so forth, but it, it, I'm comfortable with the idea of giving aid to the Kurds because it's not like arming the Mujahideen where they eventually became the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and then they turned the weapons on us. The Kurds are a different story, so perhaps, maybe I go a little further than Jill in that if you want to have a good strategy against ISIS, you could ar aid people and perhaps even arm people who are on the front line fighting ISIS who we know are good people. And then also, again, maybe I go a little further than Jill in that when there's a genocide happening, because when I talk about my non-interventionist position, but oftentimes, the logical response is, yeah, well, what about Rwanda? What about when that happens? What are you going to do? Sit there with your thumb up your ass and let people fucking kill people, slaughter people as you're doing nothing? The problem there was that we didn't intervene. That's the argument people use. And my response is, no, but you're fucking conflating two things. One is U.S. military power, us using our army to do X, Y, or Z. That's one thing. It's another thing. If there's a genocide going on, do I have problem with a full-scale UN intervention where the international community all come together and we attack a problem together so that the U.S. is not one nation above other nations, but one nation among other nations? Well, there I have no problem with intervention as long as it's a UN intervention and we all do it together because when you have one nation above other nations, you set up a perverse incentive. And the Rwanda instances and the instances of actual atrocities happening then, later on, a nation above other nations gets to use that as a cover for we get to go anywhere and do anything, and maybe if we jack some natural resources, whatever, look away because we're the world police and we're, we're so altruistic and we care about human rights. So you want to stop, you want to nip that problem in the bud of one nation being above other nations because we're only human beings and human beings are not perfect and we have poor incentives. So, if you attack the problem together and the UN does it, well then I'm fine with an intervention. Of course the UN should intervene when there's an actual out-and-out -out genocide going on somewhere. So maybe in that, uh, you know, respect, I go a little further than Jill Stein, but honestly that's probably not even the case because I feel like if I bring this up to her, she'd be like, no, of course, I'd, I'd do that, totally. But then, the heart of her anti-terrorism plan is, STOP FUNDING THEM, JACKASS! <laughs> Which is like, www. Duh.com And people go, well, what do you mean? We're not doing that now. Oh, oh yeah, is that right? We're not doing that now? Huh. We just gave Saudi Arabia over a billion dollars in weapons. They turned around and started bombing civilians in Yemen immediately. They bombed a school and they bombed a Doctors Without Borders hospital this week. And you go, okay, but that doesn't get in the hands of terrorists. Wrong. Saudi Arabia arms Sunni militias fighting on the ground in Yemen against the Houthi Shia rebels. Who are those Sunni militias? Al-Qaeda. They've also armed rebels in Syria. The majority of rebels in Syria at this point are Islamists and Jihadists. You know, you have Saudi Arabia spread Wahhabism throughout the world as poisonous, toxic, ultra-conservative, fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. Step number one in being serious about fighting Jihadism and ISIS and Al-Qaeda is stop... FUNDING THEM! STOP IT! STOP IT! STOP IT! STOP IT! Furthermore, in Syria, the CIA is arming one set of rebels, the Pentagon is arming another set of rebels, those rebels are fighting each other. We had a program where we trained uh, Syrian rebels. Guess what happened? The second they got into Syria, they turned over their weapons to al-Nusra, which was al-Qaeda in Syria. Okay, step number one, Jill is 100% right. Stop arming them, stop funding them, and also, here's a crazy idea. Uh, look at the evidence and the data. So we started the war on terror. More, well over a decade later, there are now more terrorists than there were before. So whatever strategy you're using hasn't fucking worked. So all the run and gun, cowboy, shoot em up mentality, it's made the problem worse. Our drone program kill hits the wrong target 90% of the time! Hmm, I wonder if that's gonna create more terrorists and anti-Americanism throughout the Middle East. That's a hard one. I wonder if CIA black sites where torture goes on, gives ISIS a propaganda victory, and then helps recruit more people. Did you know when ISIS was executing people, remember when they were executing journalists not that long ago, over, a little over a year ago? They were wearing orange jumpsuits. Why? 
Well, they said this is because of the people who were at Guantanamo who were wearing this. So how about we don't give them a fucking victory in the propaganda realm? We don't torture innocent people, which we've done. We don't kill innocent people with drones, which we've done. We're not, you know, fucking brazen in our civilian casualty rate. I mean, look at the civilian deaths in Iraq. So what Jill is saying is stop creating more terrorists and stop arming the terrorists. And outside of that, yes, we can use our military for self-defense. Wild! No, except it's common sense. And it's the only person in this twilight zone of a presidential race at this point who's making any sense.